Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today, and welcome to Fundraising Reset, What to Do This Summer. My name is Ellen Claycomb, and I will be kicking off our webinar today. Today's webinar is the third in a three-part series. For development teams, summer is the season of organization. It's when we step away from our busy day-to-day -day and prepare for the year ahead. This summer, a reset is especially important. We need to get focused and organized to prepare for an uncertain future. In our first conversation, we discussed how to build your new case for support. Last week, we focused on how to organize your list. Today, we'll walk through how to create an engagement or stewardship program. Recordings and recaps can be found at aperiophilanthropy.com backslash fearless. We will also be emailing them around to you for easy access. Before we get started, a little bit about us. Aperio is a fundraising consulting firm created by a group of fundraisers who believe that nonprofits can do more than just survive, but rather they can thrive. We believe that your mission, your donors, and your team have more potential, and we're here to make it simple to realize that potential. As you'll hear today, our passion is for going beyond great ideas. We know that the challenge is less often what to do, but rather how to get it done among competing priorities. In creating our firm, we've listened, learned, and distilled what works into a clear roadmap that any nonprofit can follow. The building blocks of that roadmap are people, a clear business model, and a culture of philanthropy. We work along side organizations, large and small, to implement this roadmap and to unlock new fundraising potential. Here's who you're gonna hear from today. Again, my name is Ellen Claycomb, and I'll be presenting with my colleagues, Bianca DeRooney and Laura Saffron. We will be sharing with you what we have learned from our clients, conversations with nonprofit leaders and fundraisers around the country, and importantly, our on the ground work as, at leading nonprofits earlier in our careers, including the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, the American Red Cross, City Harvest, and the New York Foundation for the Arts, just to name a few. We have all walked in your shoes and we're excited to be a part of your journey during this unique time. For context, during our first webinar, we discussed how to build your new case for support. We talked about how every organization needs to take a fresh approach to their storytelling because the fundraising landscape has changed so much in the last few months. We talked about using Simon Sinek's golden circle to guide our thinking and starting with defining our why. Then last week, we talked about how your database has more potential. The first step is getting organized and segmenting your list. Today, we are going to stitch it all together and talk about how to create a donor engagement plan. That is to create an efficient, effective way to constantly be bringing your why to each of your donor segments. We're gonna walk through how to approach stewardship, how to create your acknowledgement and stewardship plan, how to create your donor experience plan, and how to layer on moves management. As promised, we are going to get into the weeds a little bit on the how, but we also promise we'll keep it interesting. Our presentation is going to take about an hour, and then we're gonna have 30 minutes for questions and a robust discussion. A few housekeeping items first. You may have noticed that we are recording this session. Don't worry, we'll turn off the recording when we get to the Q&A session to protect your confidentiality. Everyone except the speakers is currently on mute. We will give you the option to unmute during the Q&A. Feel free to start dropping your questions into the chat as we go so that you don't forget them. Some of you will hear our presentation today and think, no problem, this is a breeze. Or maybe you've already done this work and you're ready for the next level. Congratulations. We would be more than happy to talk to you about advanced next steps. Others may feel like you want more detail and want to go slower. Rest assured, we have plenty of resources for you. If you feel confident about the process, but just want a little more detail on the steps, you can use the planning template that we will be sending around following this webinar. We also offer a free one hour session to all webinar attendees to answer any questions that you may have. Many people use these sessions to talk through how to apply what we covered to their unique context. Finally, if you walk away feeling this is super important, but nobody on my team has time to do this, you can also just have us do the work for you. We're gonna be sending around information about our summer reset package, which gives you hands-on hands -on support 
at a super discounted rate. All right, let's get started. I'm gonna hand it over to Bianca. Good afternoon, everyone. Bianca here. As Ellen shared, we're gonna start with the big picture, how to approach stewardship. The place to start is to ask ourselves, why do we need stewardship? And specifically, why do we need a new approach? The answer is that we are not who we were a few months ago. As we've been discussing in this series, the crisis that we're facing is not a temporary blip. It's not a quick pause. It isn't even just one crisis. We are all indefinitely and probably permanently changed. And that means we need to adjust our strategies and make big leaps, such as diversifying our revenue beyond events. Second, your mission is not the same. Your mission was created in a certain context to solve a problem or to uh, create an opportunity. And because the context has changed, the role of your mission in the world has changed too. And finally, your donors are not the same. Your donors are people too. They have been through everything that you've been through in the past few months. And the way to think about the world and your mission and their role in it is different now. And that means the way they think about their giving is different. You'll need to reestablish your connection with them and learn who they are now. Before we dive into our topic at hand, I'm gonna recap some slides from last week that I think we can't review enough times. And I'm gonna start by saying, again, <laughs> your database has more potential, much, much more potential. It has new potential because of the new fundraising landscape, but it also has potential that's been there all along. I've spent my career working with teams across the country to kickstart their relationship-based fundraising programs, and I've never met a database that didn't hold at least a couple of years of dynamic revenue growth just from thinking about the same supporters in new ways. When we talk to boards and new clients, a uh, refrain we hear often is, our database is stale, we need new donors. This may be true for some organizations, but in our experience, more often than not, the real need is to invest in retaining the donors you already have acquired. Our acquisition channels are our most expensive forms of fundraising, events, peer-to-peer, -peer, direct mail, and that means that every new donor we acquire is very expensive. Sometimes in uh, channels such as direct mail, we don't even make a profit for our mission until at least the second or third gift. Unfortunately, what tends to happen though, is as soon as we've acquired a new batch of donors, we get pulled away to focus on the next event or the next fundraiser or the next appeal. And we overlook the donors that we just spent all of that time and money acquiring. We miss that opportunity to bring them into the family in meaningful and sustainable ways. The stats you see on the screen here show us that on average, nonprofits retain about 45% of donors year over year. That means we effectively make our case to existing supporters in a way that uh, inspires a little under half of our donors to renew their gift. That also means on the flip side there, that 55% of donors don't renew their gift year over year. If your organization doesn't yet have a relationship-based fundraising program, such as a middle or middle, uh, middle or major giving program or institutional gifts, your retention light rate is likely much lower. For example, as we started working on a major gift program at one organization I worked for, we analyzed the retention rate just at the 10K plus level. At the time, we received about 2,000 gifts over $10,000 every year, primarily from events and peer-to-peer. -peer. Of those, only 25% renewed at the following year, which means that every year we were finding 1,500 new $10,000 donors. Not only is that an exhausting way to fundraise, it's an extremely expensive way to fundraise, and it robs our mission of vital funding. So clearly our attention is never gonna be 100%, but every percentage increase is a win. It means more revenue for our mission at a lower cost per gift, since retention is less expensive than acquisition. In case you're not worried about this yet, here's another stat. <laughs> our friends over at Pursuant have created a donor loyalty benchmarking study. They dug into the data of 21 organizations and found that 62% of donors in these databases had only given one gift lifetime. So the question that I keep asking organizations that are big on acquisition is, what are you acquiring them for? 
If you're not willing to invest in the systems and the people to engage, inspire, and ask donors for renewals, there's no point in acquiring new donors. The profit on the first gift, as I said, is minimal. The real value of the donor comes from their lifetime giving. For these organizations, the average lifetime giving of donors who were retained was over $1,000. So if 30 of the donors that made these one-time gifts remained engaged, that would be $30,000 more for the mission. If 300, 300,000. 3,000, 3 million. You get the picture. A donor we don't engage is not revenue lost once, it's revenue lost for a lifetime. So, what does it take to renew a donor? That's what we're gonna be talking about today. What I know is that to stay engaged, donors don't need fancy technology and they don't need big events. What they need is you. They need you to do all the things <laughs> that we know that we should be doing that we never seem to have time for. They need you to provide timely acknowledgements, meaning within a week at most. They need updates throughout the year about how their gift is at work. They need ways to get more involved and excited and inspired by your mission. They need opportunities to meet other donors, which can be where your events come in, but they don't need to be big productions. They just need to be interactive. And they need opportunities to meet with you, both as groups um, and one-on-one -on -one and so on. The bottom line is they need you. You may be thinking to yourself, Bianca, this all sounds great, but there are so many donors. There's only one of me, or maybe there's just a few of us. How are we supposed to provide all of this for everyone? Enter segmentation. Segmentation is just a fancy word for organizing your list. It means that you're gonna be grouping your current and prospective donors into a handful of lists. When we have organized our list, it becomes easier to invest in stewardship. Stewardship is a word that we use a lot at nonprofits. It has come to mean both everything and absolutely nothing. So before we dig in, let's define what it is that we mean. In February, Aperio brought together a group of fundraisers to discuss stewardship. We asked them, how do you define the word? Here are some of their answers. Building an ongoing relationship of trust and accountability with donors. The actions and interactions that we implement with the donor volunteer or constituent to make them feel more connected to an, on, to an organization's missions and build deeper relationships, the careful and proper management of an investment, including communication about how the investment is being used and the impact and results of the investment, making donors feel appreciated without constantly being asked for more money. Where we landed after this discussion was that there are three components to the definition. First, Stewardship is something that we do. It is a combination of culture, practices, and processes that we build with intention. Second, stewardship has a clear purpose to provide every donor with a meaningful experience. Third, stewardship's ROI is in the growth of our relationship with the donor, as well as their giving and engagement over time. To stitch it all together, we say that stewardship is the culture, practices, and processes that provide every donor with a meaningful experience that grows their relationship, engagement, and giving over time. Thanks, Ellen. Hi, everyone. It's Laura here. I want to draw your attention to one of the words that Ellen said and in that definition that I think is most important, and that's processes. I recently worked at an organization with a lot of generous supporters. We had big events. We had really successful capital campaigns, a very robust direct mail program, you name it. We thought that we were doing well at stewardship because we kept getting donations and we had a lot of relationships with donors. But as our program grew, we realized that the donations and relationships were not enough. We were missing opportunities at every step of the way. If you gave $1,000 to an event, for example, you were getting a really exciting donor experience than maybe if you gave just $1,000 directly to the mission. You gave $250,000 maybe to our capital campaign, you might get a lot of recognition at the beginning and at the end of the campaign, but maybe we were losing sight of you over the years as you were paying off that pledge. It became really clear that we needed processes. We needed a system. This is just one example. I'm sure that many of you can apply this to your organization, but we all know that you need process. 
at Aperio, we've really become passionate about this topic because we've learned through our conversations with fundraisers around the country that most nonprofits don't have these processes in place. When we asked that group back in February, most people said that everyone is determining how to steward people that they work with. Some said that they had put into place some resources and guidelines, and really only a handful said that they had formal centralized programs. So you may be thinking to yourself, why is it a bad thing that everyone is determining how they steward people that they work with? Let me give you an example. A donor in an MGO's portfolio makes, let's say, a $25,000 gift. The MGO is asked to handle the tax letters for the donors herself. So she's writing the letter for the donor. She does a couple of revisions with the CDO and eventually gets that letter out. But maybe she's getting busy. Maybe she goes on vacation. Maybe there's a pandemic that suddenly hits and there's way more letters to write than time to write them. Now, this loyal, generous donor is waiting three, maybe even four weeks for a tax letter, but someone who made a $100 donation gets a letter within a week. Here's another example. Your organization has a breakthrough. Say the FDA approves a cancer drug that you funded, and now you wanna let all the donors know. A press release might go out, direct response email goes out, and everyone knows within 24 hours of the approval. Everyone except for maybe this donor because the MGO has opted her, all of her portfolio donors out of the direct response pool. Maybe she says, I'm gonna tell them myself, but then a few days go by, maybe a few weeks, and before she has the time to get the emails out, they haven't gone out. Maybe she forgets that she suppressed these donors from direct response, and maybe they never hear the news at all. Now, your top donors are the last people to get this information. I think you get my point. From your organization's perspective, you all know that stewardship program is efficient and effective when these three things happen. No donor is falling through the cracks. All of the donors are treating well, but not equally, meaning that you can create special opportunities for donors as they grow in their impact of your mission. And everyone internally knows their role and plays it. So engagement is simple and seamless, and it's not a confusing hassle to get each mailing out or to get each cultivation event planned. Even more importantly, the donor will feel all the time that their gift was used well and as they intended, that their partnership truly makes a difference, and that they have a role in the future of the mission. Now let's talk about how you get to that place of success. Here's the process. Number one, gain alignment around goals. Number two, segment your donors. Number three, catalog assets. Number four, create a framework. Number five, operationalize processes. And number six, roll it out both internally and externally. Step one is to gain alignment around your goals. Why are we investing in our stewardship plan? And how will stewardship benefit our work? Maybe you're trying to build loyalty as we face a recession. Maybe you're trying to bring your event donors closer to your mission to inspire them to give directly to your work without an event. Maybe you're trying to convert new crisis donors to ongoing supporters. Or maybe you have so many supporters that you can no longer handle them one-on-one. -on -one. Whatever your reasons, let's take a moment to reflect. Have this conversation across departments, not just within development. Talk about it with marketing and communications, with programs, with your leadership, et cetera. Talk to them about why now is the time. The second step is to segment our donors to determine, number one, who are the 20% of donors that we need to focus on? And number two, where are our biggest growth opportunities? For more detail on our recommended approach, see the materials from last week. To briefly recap, our recommended method is to start with a small list of core segments that are high potential donors tiered into tiers one, two, and three, middle donors, sustainers, and general donors. Every donor belongs to exactly one of these. Beyond these segments, we know that there are other special groups in your database, such as your board members, board alumni, COVID donors, people with planned giving potential, event supporters, people with special mission interests, and people with special geographic interest. So 
some donors will also belong to one or more of these. As we build our engagement plan, we first get to catalog our assets. And by that, I mean that we get to be creative before we start doing the deep dive planning. This is, as Ellen mentioned, another opportunity to bring your colleagues together. So fundraisers, marketing communications, programs, leadership, et cetera. And you're gonna discuss two questions. What do we currently offer donors? Make a list. And what, are, what other ideas do we have? You'll be surprised how long the list is. As you make the list, think about, um, excuse me, we have some jo folks joining us here. Um, as you make the list, set aside your practical considerations. Don't think about the who, the what, the when, the where, the how, just catalog all the things that you have to offer. And then as you're thinking about it, think about why throughout this webinar we've been saying engagement more often than stewardship. Often we've become um, conditioned to think about stewardship as something that we do to donors after they give. So here, what we're thinking about is both before and after the gift, so we're including cultivation. But more importantly, what we're really trying to do is spark interaction. We're trying to create a two-way exchange, a conversation, a reaction from the donor. So these are things that we do, but we do them for the purpose of listening to what the donor says back, how the donor responds. And we think of every response, whether it's big or small, as the donor quote unquote waving at us, um, saying, I want more, I wanna learn more, I wanna do more, I wanna hear more. So as you brainstorm, here are categories to think about. What are all the ways that we can thank a donor for their giving? What are all the ways we can recognize and celebrate their generosity publicly or privately? What are all the ways we can show them the impact of their gift? What are all the ways we can help them experience the mission firsthand so they get the same fire in their belly that you have? What are all the ways we can connect them to a community of supporters and create a sense of belonging? Okay, here's my favorite part. We get to start actually planning. We're gonna create a framework in two steps, asking the questions, how will we acknowledge gifts? And second, how will we engage, or engage the donors in another way? There are two components to our stewardship framework an acknowledgement and recognition plan, and this is where we're gonna map out what a donor should receive based on their gift size this year. Then we're gonna look at the donor experience plan, where we add on more experiences based on a donor's segment or their potential for future growth. Besides those two pieces of our stewardship framework, we know that our top donors are also gonna be receiving moves management touch points. These three pieces together is what makes up a donor's experience with your organization. To steward donors effectively and efficiently, you really need to have all three of these puzzle pieces. So let's tackle the first puzzle piece first. When we talk about acknowledgement, what picture is coming to mind? For many of us, it's a tax letter. As I mentioned in my example before, we place a lot of importance on getting the perfect letter to everyone. We spend a lot of time customizing them for top donors, but we're recommending that you go beyond your tax letter. Think about all the different ways that you can thank a donor and all the different people that can be involved. They can receive an email, a letter, a handwritten note, a phone call. That can come from the relationship manager. It could come from someone in leadership, your CEO, your ED, your CDO, your DOD. It can come from a client, maybe a program staff, or maybe even an expert, like a scientist in our example before. It could also come from a board member. Think about your acknowledgement plan as your organization's comprehens comprehensive reaction to their gift. It should include thank you touch points, as well as recognition touch points. Think about how you treat a donor in an event. How can we all bring that same level of acknowledgement and recognition to donors that give directly to the mission? And when we're talking about a gift made in this fiscal year, think about a plan on a longer timeline than just the weeks immediately following the gift. 
You want to get your acknowledgement letter out, like Bianca said, within a week. Have a template that you use for everyone. Mix it up every couple of months, but make it short, warm, and inspiring. Do an additional thank you touch point for larger donors. Here's where your personalized letters, your handwritten notes, and your phone calls can come in. Then do a mid-year thank you to donors. This is going to be a great way to engage your board. Maybe every month or so, give each one a stack of cards to sign or maybe a list of donors that they can call. Make it easy and try and make it fun. Within the year of the gift, you have to deliver any recognition touch points that you promise to the larger donors. That might include your naming opportunities, donor walls, names and annual reports, listing and websites, all of those things. The team at Aperio had recently talked to a fundraiser who became a major donor as she moved into the retirement. And we were asking her, what have you learned as a donor that you wish you knew when you were a fundraiser? And she had told us that she really wished she had known how many donors just want a quick and fast tax letter. She felt it was really frustrating to have to wait a month before someone spends perfect, you know, the time spending, put, spending the time crafting a perfect letter. She really just wanted it soon. So again, get that tax letter out really fast and then keep the acknowledgement and recognition pieces going throughout the year. So to create the acknowledgement and recognition plan, you wanna create what really looks like a benefits matrix. At the top, you'll see we have the size of the gift. And then along the left, we have the acknowledgement and recognition touch points. We've separated out here in Coral for the things that need to happen immediately against the things that need to happen within a year. A few other things I wanna point out you want to make a plan for how you'll treat the formalization of a new multi-year pledge against how you'll treat the payments. You also want to plan on providing extra recognition for board members as well as your board alumni because you, we know that you'll want to acknowledge them at a higher level than normal. Finally, if you have a planned giving program in place, that's great, but make sure that you're creating a plan for acknowledging and recognition, recognizing those planned giving intentions that are coming through. And if your organization has annual giving societies, you can use those categories for the basis of this chart. Okay, now let's dig into the second puzzle piece, our donor experience plan. What's important to remember here, acknowledgement and recognition alone are not enough to inspire donor loyalty and increase that retention rate that Bianca spoke about. What we need are experiences we need to layer on additional touch points. Opportunities to see the impact of a gift. Opportunities to experience the mission firsthand. Opportunities to connect with the community. All of these have a clear purpose, to connect your donors to the why that drives your organization, as we discussed in the first webinar. That why is what drives behavior and decisions to stay involved. That why is what drives loyalty and growth. What we're gonna do now is marry that catalog of assets that we created within our segments. First, we are going to create a donor experience plan, but this time across the top, we have our segments and special groups. The reason for the switch is that when we work on acknowledgement and recognition, we're thinking of exclusivity, reserving special touches for our largest donors. When we work on experiences, we're thinking of inclusivity, bringing as many potential donors into the family as we can efficiently. For experience, we want to think about a person or organization's future potential rather than their past or their current giving. That way we are investing our limited time and resources in the highest ROI relationships. The experience plan gets translated into a calendar. This calendar is shared among all departments. It includes all communications, events, and experiences, and then spells out who will receive them. The last two steps in the engagement planning process are to operationalize the processes that make this magic happen, and then to roll it out both internally and externally. A few lessons learned from our experiences. Start simple. You have your big catalog of assets now, so you can always add in touch points, but start with what you can feasibly deliver and deliver well. Meet as a team at least monthly to walk through the upcoming touch points and to work out any logistics. Use anything you create as broadly as possible. Don't reinvent the wheel. Tweak the delivery for top donors if needed. 
Most importantly, as Bianca will discuss further in a moment, do not suppress your top donors from your email program. Rather, reduce the frequency or coordinate with marketing and communications to curate which ones they are receiving. Before we turn it over to you for questions and discussion, I want to say a few words about where Moves Management fits into this. As Laura shared, there are two big pieces of the puzzle for your stewardship program, your acknowledgement and recognition plan, and then the engagement plan that Ellen just went over. So the idea with Moves Management is that it layers on top for your portfolio donors. As you're listening to this, you may be wondering, well, as a gift officer or as an account manager, what is there left for me to do after all these other things are taken care of centrally? Let's dig into that. The answer lies, as with most things related to relationship-based fundraising, in the 80-20 rule. You, as the front rank frontline fundraiser should be doing those 20% of activities that drive 80% of the results. So rather than focusing on becoming a duplicate communications and marketing arm of your organization, you can trust your colleagues in marketing communication to do that 80% for you. And instead, you can focus your moves management time on that 20% that only a person can do, and that must be done personally. So those are things like phone calls or meetings, a personal note to see how the donor is doing, a handwritten note, an introduction to a board member, connection to a personalized volunteer experience, a tour, a site visit, a chat with your CEO, those kinds of things. That's where the magic happens, and those are the things that we call moves. Give me one second, excuse me. Having some technical difficulties. <laughs> So as Courtney outlined for us last week, um, we uh, have a three-part approach to tiering our portfolios. So we uh, list everyone in our portfolios as either one, two, or three. And the idea is that you're providing the most personalized experience to the top. What that means is that for your bottom tier, their experience is going to come primarily from that engagement and acknowledgement plan that we've just developed. And every once in a while, every couple of months, every quarter, you're going to layer on a move to see if you can move the relationship forward. At the top, on tier one, most of your moves are going to be personalized. So you're going to be relying heavily on your moves management plan and using those other engagement plans as supplemental touch points. So let's think about this as an analogy. Um, so here are some building blocks. Think about these as your donor experience. The columns represent your segments. So over on the far right, you have your tier one donors. And on the far left, you have your general donors. To create their experience, we're gonna start by creating the, the acknowledgement and recognition plan. And that is gonna be the baseline of your experience. Then, as Ellen said, for those higher potential donors, we're going to layer on additional experiences, our donor experience plan. And that's going to take care of most of the building blocks. And those two together, as I said, are what we consider your stewardship program. So as a relationship manager, then what you're adding on with Moves Management is just those top blocks for the columns on the right. These things work together to create the donor experience. So the risk is if as a relationship manager, you're not trusting the rest of the plan and you're suppressing your donors from different communications is you're saying, well, I'm going to deliver it all myself. <laughs> and so what happens is you take away that bottom tier of the block and you say, okay, well, I'm going to be responsible for this whole column. In reality, that never happens. It simply isn't possible to provide that many touch points to that many donors in the number of hours that we have in a day. So what ends up happening is that rather than you spending your time on news management, you're spending all your time scrambling just to acknowledge and just basically communicate with donors. Donors fall through the cracks, they're the last to know the news, and their experience quality goes down. Let me give you two examples that bring to life what this collaboration can look like. So we'll use one example for, uh, from some folks on the phone here from the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery 
uh, foundation. So this is an e-newsletter that they sent to their donors and me um, this week. And so uh, if your major donors in the email program, they would have received this newsletter. So rather than thinking, okay, well now the communication's done, they've gotten the news, here's what we do as a relationship manager. We can forward the same email to them that they've already received, but maybe haven't seen, and we can say, um, wanted to be sure you saw the latest news on this drug that you helped fund, or I know you've been watching the news on this, Here, here's the, the latest update, wanted to make sure you saw it. Or thanks for all you do to make this progress possible. Um, another example here is um, this email from the Diabetes Research Institute Foundation. Right after the pandemic hit, um, the CEO, Sean Kramer, recorded a short video to just send a message of support and hope out to the community. So this went out to the whole email list. But about a day before it went out, the stewardship lead there created this template that you see here and shared it with all of the gift officers so that they could, in a very simple mail merge through their email, send this to the donors in their portfolio. So it just says, dear donor, as we all start to feel the effects of the pandemic, affecting our families and our businesses and our communities, we here at DRIF are thinking of you and your loved ones. Our CEO asked that I share this message with you personally. So to the recipient, it feels personal, but it's efficient for the relationship manager to do. And most importantly, they can do it before everybody gets the email on the general list that we see on the left. What they also did was then from their mail merge, they picked out a handful of people that they had maybe spoken to recently or that were VIPs that they wanted to check in with personally. And so for those five or 10 or however many, they actually wrote a personal note. So using the template from the stewardship person, just layering in, a, you know, I'm thinking of you during this difficult time. I hope Johnny got home from college okay, you know, that kind of thing. And rather than having to then think of that kind of a personal note, for 150 people, now we have a much more efficient way to create the same touch point for the same list of donors. What makes this work is a couple of things. Um, obviously, as you heard in the beginning there, uh, is a relationship between marketing, communications, and fundraising. And that takes time to build, but the more you communicate, the easier it becomes. Second, it takes somebody who's in charge of stewardship to make that decision to say, okay, well, we're going to include all of our portfolio donors in this email, but before we do that, we're gonna add this additional touch from the CEO. Here's the template, everybody, ready, get, set, go. Ideally, you wanna give relationship managers at least like 36 to 48 hours to actually turn that around because things happen, donor meetings happen, life happens, um, but sometimes in a crisis, it's not possible. Um, but the most important thing is the third item here is that that the relationship managers actually do the mail merge and send it and don't let perfection be the enemy of progress that they get the message out the whole foundation of the system that we've been talking to uh, is trust and i see some questions in the chat already about the implementation challenges and and so where we'll leave you as we sort of pivot into discussion here is that this really does rely, as Ellen said, on regular monthly communication, and it takes time to build up this process. But with a little upfront organization, you have a starting, uh, the starting framework that then you can start working on and improving as you go. As a reminder, we are here to support you. In a follow-up email, we will be sending out a planning template that you can use to capture your ideas. We're also available for a free one-hour brainstorming session. And we're offering discounted packages to make this work a lot easier for you, and even do the big pieces for you. The packages start at $1,000, so don't miss out.